Hey, y'all. Cheers. I don't know how uh, everyone's feeling tonight. It's good to see everyone. It um, feels odd. Feels odd. I do have a flannel on. I have to tell you, I'm glad that we are experiencing some autumnal weather in the south. Tomorrow is supposed to be a high of 60, which i um, pretty excited about. And Tuesday is supposed to be cold as well, which, I mean, at least we've got that going for us. But this is a um, pretty bad little time. I'm glad that uh, you all came by. Hopefully we can find a little... Um, Levity is not the right word, but hopefully we can find a little community tonight. We can find a little sanity tonight. Um, the past couple of days, I, I have to tell you, I, I don't know how everyone felt, but to get an extra hour this weekend was a cruel joke by a society. And we had to get an extra hour of waiting on this election to start. I have um, <clears throat> I've spent a lot of time yeah, I think that's what I said. I, I think that's what I said on the on the the Muckrake podcast. Is it feels like, you know, that you have a surgery coming up, and you know what day it is, and you just have to sort of sit with it. <clears throat> I uh, I've, I've sat with this election uh, for the past few days, and I I still sort of if if you haven't heard it yet, we did a uh, election preview on the Muckrake podcast. I still stand by my predictions there i still feel pretty confident in what we talked about and what we predicted there but i have to tell you that the the past couple of days have been trying trying's a word uh it feels it feels particularly scary because the trump campaign has been I mean, they're not hiding it. They're not hiding what they're planning. Um, you know, they're 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 pretty open about it. How this thing's going to go down, which is the worst part about it, and how they're going to play things on Tuesday. Uh, it's very obvious that Trump is going to declare victory on Tuesday when there's a discrepancy between in-person voting and. Um, and um, absentee votes and mail-in votes. So we're going to talk, obviously, about that. But before we do, I just want to talk very quickly uh, before we get to the questions. I, you know, this is my thing I do on Sunday. So I'm going to, I hope you forgive me for a second. I was feeling nostalgic isn't the right word, but I was thinking about how for the past five years I've been covering Donald Trump going back into 2015, going to his rallies, and then 2016, of course, covering the rallies for these outlets and stuff. And I was just thinking about how, you know, when I was going into these rallies and reporting from them, and, and many of you probably might not have even have heard of me back then. It's been weird, like, when people probably followed me or listened to me or, you know, gave a shit what I had to say. I, um, oh, we're going to talk about the Trump thing in Texas with the trucks. For sure. But, you know, it's just thinking back to what it was like going into those rallies and talking to the supporters and having them tell me what they wanted and how they felt. And, you know, the, the, the racist, misogynistic, fascistic stuff. I'm just personally, I'm coming to terms with what it has been like to cover this thing since 2015 and to feel like I knew what Donald Trump was capable of and to watch it unfold. I have wished time and time again that I was wrong. I get I get emails and messages a lot lately. I get a lot of messages that are like, you know, are you, you know, are you happy that you got this right? I'm not happy I got any of it right. I wish like hell we weren't in this situation. It sucks. This whole situation sucks. And I hate that we have to talk right now about a president who might try and undermine the election and um, undermine democracy. I hate that we even have to consider that. 
it sucks. So I will say before we get to the questions for the night, cheers. We made it through four years of Donald Trump so far. It was a hell of a task getting through this thing, this criminal, reckless, cruel presidency. <clears throat> it's been awful. And watching our democratic institutions crumble in front of him and watching the Republican Party jump in with um, both feet into fascism sucked. Sucked bad. Sucked bad. Got a lot of got a lot of gray hairs from this bullshit. I'm tired of it. I want to win on Tuesday. I want to get past this thing. So far, I, I hate it. Absolutely hate it. So I will just say salute. I will, I will actually um, let's go ahead and do another cheers. So let's get into uh, the crux of this thing. I feel very strange having been on this ride for a few years. I feel completely different. Um, <laughs> oh, you told Scott Taylor about it. Oh, well, I hope Scott Taylor picked up the book and learned a little something from it. I hope people have learned about the learn from American rule. <clears throat> it's been very weird seeing people. Oh, Keith Jackson, former student. Cheers. It's always weird seeing my own student show up on these things. Has to be so strange having a guy who stood up in front of your class and lectured to you, hanging out on a porch on a Sunday, drinking bourbon, telling about the end of democracy. Cheers. I um, I have a lot, lot to say tonight, and uh, we got a lot of questions to get to a lot of things. But uh, I want to say first and foremost, uh, thank you. Thank you. It's um, I don't know if I would have gotten through these four years uh, if it wasn't for the support and the kindness of people that I didn't know four years ago. So I just want to say thank you. And I'll get very mushy about this and heartfelt about it later on. But I just want to say thank you again. The only way we're going to get through this thing, whether or not we win, we lose, we deal with a major, major crisis is each other. That's the only way we're going to get through this thing, period, is we have to be able to rely on one another and we have to find inspiration in one another. And I talk about this left and right. And we're going to get into the ugly business of this election. But I keep saying it and I mean it. The only way that we move forward in this thing and the only thing, only way that we find something better is if we repair the atomization of society and we learn to take care of each other again. That's it. That's the only way we do it. It's the only way we do it. Bagam Sam says, what do you think about liberal certainty that hashtag dear leader will lose on Tuesday? I will say this, and, and I hope that maybe this registers with people. Don't look at polls. Quit looking at polls. Polls are both misleading and they're there to either create anxiety or they're there to confirm some sort of deeply held belief that you have. Polls don't matter. They don't matter at all. Uh, you know, if you read a poll tonight, it will not change what happens on Tuesday, period. It's not going to change one thing or another. Stop looking at polls. Stop thinking about polls. Put it away. And I'm, I'm telling you, I will. I, 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 I've, I've stopped looking at, looking at polls and I've, I've moved my energy elsewhere. I've redirected the energy that I would use for polls. So don't even worry about that. Think about Tuesday. Be ready for Tuesday. Have energy for Tuesday. Be ready for whatever happens. But I, um, yeah, I would not worry about polls. These are media creations that are supposed to help this horse race mythology and storytelling and narrative telling. I don't worry about them. Don't worry about them right now. And I and I, I hope you can take this and this isn't meant to demoralize people, but I hope that you hear me when I say this. It doesn't matter if Biden blows Trump out of the water. That doesn't mean that Trump won't try and steal the election. It doesn't mean that he won't turn on the machine, the anti-democracy machine that they have created. That operation is sealed and it's ready to go. Stop worrying about that. Stop thinking that there's like a certain electoral count that it just won't happen. 
I've said it before, the best case scenario is a sour grape situation where Trump says, you know what, I don't want to be your fucking president anyway. And y'all are a bunch of losers and I don't care who you vote for. That's the best case scenario that we can hope for. But a Biden landslide does not mean that the election won't be stolen. It actually means in some cases that it could be even more possible. So just be careful. Just turn off the polls, stop expecting one thing or another, and just be prepared for everything. Miller says, do you think this weekend's MAGA traffic blockades were a trial balloon for blocking access to polling sites on Tuesday? Yeah, I do. And I couldn't have put it better. These strange highway tie-ups are uh, important of what could possibly happen on Tuesday. Uh, we are looking at... <laughs> We're looking at a lot of people who are going to be going to polling places in order to intimidate people, in order to jam up people. And uh, I, I think there's a real possibility on Tuesday that we might see groups of these people tying up, you know, major highways, streets, thoroughfares. I absolutely think that's a possibility. I think a lot of Trump people have signed up for um poll observation and by that it's not even like a legal poll observation we're talking about people going looking for something suspicious which means um you know watching out for people of color and anybody that they think they think might be a democrat so yeah i think we're going to see that happen i've talked to enough people in the know that most people explain it or i mean most people expect it not explain it but they expect it um yeah, we're probably looking at people trying to tie these things up and trying to intimidate. I, I think that's exactly one of the things that we're looking. Catherine says, do you think these election intimidation tactics by Trump supporters, caravans, et cetera, along with attendance support by some law enforcement members helps or hurts Democrats turning out to vote? I think it hurts, but I also think that we need to be careful about thinking about when or wins or losses. Um, I just want people to get to the polls. I we, we need to understand that everybody who wants to vote should be able to go vote. And I don't care who they vote for when they get into the polls. I hope that they vote against Donald Trump. But we can't think about everything as a trench warfare situation. Does it help this person hurt this person? Hurting democracy in general hurts everybody, whether or not it keeps left, right, blue, red out of the polls. It, it, it's really, really bad. I don't know if it's going to help Democrats, but I have to tell you that I really do see, um, I see a lot of people being turned away from the polls based on this stuff. I think intimidation works, and I think uh, we're going to see a lot of it on Tuesday. William, talk about the fact that the tactics we're seeing now that I've heard, personally witnessed today are ones we didn't see from supporters of Reagan or Bush or Clinton or Obama or McCain or Romney. No, this is a new phenomenon. And what we are watching is we're watching fascism. And I I don't know about the rest of you. I'm so damn tired of people wringing their hands about calling this fascism. It is about silencing and keeping people who disagree for, with them from being able to vote or being able to engage in democracy. That's what it is. Devin, I'll answer the Glenn Greenwald question here in a second because I have thoughts on, on this whole thing. Um... I, we're not just watching fascism. We're seeing it come into full bloom. The problem isn't that Trump might win based on the Electoral College, which is the only way he could possibly win, but it's based on the idea that the only way he could possibly win is if people aren't allowed to vote and they're kept from voting. It's about winning elections or winning power or maintaining or consolidating power based on force and intimidation and violence. That's what this thing is. And it's completely different. And, you know, I, I, I tweeted about this last night, like Trump endorsed it. He, in, he endorsed this bullshit thing in Texas. And if you watch the videos, they are trying to run vehicles off the road. Like they are obviously trying to intimidate not just Biden, Harris people, but anybody around them. And they're just taking chances with people's lives left and right. And Trump endorsed it because, of course, he did. He has no regulator. He has no conscience. He will do and endorse anything that helps him, period. And if we end up on election day and there are people out there, Trumpist, with guns and weapons and they're intimidating people at polling places, he'll endorse that. He'll say that it's trying to, you know, help stamp out corruption or fraud or whatever, you know, bullshit is, is how he explains it. 
That's who he is. And after all this time, we have to understand that that's who he is. We have to stop letting this surprise us. It's how he behaves. It's how he operates. He has no regulator. It's who he is. It's how he is wired. He is a violent, fascistic man, period. And for him to endorse that is not only an indictment of him, but it's an indictment of the Republican Party in the state of America right now. We are dealing with fascism, period. There's no other explanation for this. We are in a fascistic moment right now. And I, I, I don't want to engage in hi, hi, hyperbole because I know that a lot of people think that, you know, people like me or, or Kinsey or, or even, you know, Charlotte, I, I think that they think that we're doing this as some sort of a grift or something. This isn't a grift. We are in the middle of a fascistic moment. And that's who his supporters are. I mean, they resemble fascistic sectarian violence in, in other countries. It's just a matter of when we get there and how it looks and how it operates. That's who they are. I we're gonna talk more about the violence after the you know, after the election or what we could be looking at, but it is a fascistic movement. And, and, and it's not a slogan. It's not something to get retweets or likes on Twitter or engagement or whatever bullshit people think it's about. Like It's a literal fascistic movement. So real fast, Devin Hall said, what are your thoughts on the Glenn Greenwald situation? First and foremost, I've talked to enough people who have worked with Glenn, Glenn Greenwald. And first and foremost, everyone who works with him is like, eventually he will turn on you and, and he is volatile and he'll be awful to you. So I wasn't shocked that him and the Interceptor are um, you know splitting. I think that he has found his niche and who will have him on TV is Tucker Carlson. So that's what he's going to do. And he has embraced the right. Yeah. Hey, Nick, it's good to have you on here. Oh, yeah. Greenwald has decided that this is his business, that he is going to be an iconoclast who says that the left is crazy and that, you know, that anybody who believes in anything is full of shit. He's a mess. He's an absolute dysfunctional mess. And that's who he is. And that's how he works. Kimmer says, do you think the military is backing him, Trump, if he loses and refuses to leave, claiming the election was rigged? Will they support him and keep Biden from taking the office? So here's something that um, we need to be careful with. We need to stop thinking about all or nothing, right? Whether or not all of the military would support Donald Trump or all of the military would be there for him. <clears throat> what we're looking at here is we are looking at an asymmetrical situation. There are plenty of people in the military who would support Donald Trump if he tried to remain in power. There are plenty in the military who'd realize that they have an oath to do the exact opposite of that. It's asymmetrical. It's the exact same way that any violence or sectarian action will take place here. The military brass has already put out a lot of memos and action points to say that they are supposed to pay attention to their oaths. Now, what that ends up meaning if we're in a constitutional crisis, I don't know. But I will tell you that if Donald Trump pushes some sort of litigation to steal the election and if the Supreme Court and the infrastructure of the United States upholds it, then, yeah, the military will be on his side because at that point, the military and law enforcement are all about maintaining some sort of status quo. And anybody who pushes against status quo, it ends up in a situation where they dole out violence until they stop. So, yeah, if he manages some sort of subversion of the election and it's upheld in the courts, then absolutely the military and law enforcement will be on his side. At that point, it's not even about choices. It's about the state maintaining its power in the face of an insurgency. That's just the case. Rachel says the police seem increasingly unwilling to protect and serve. They're laying the caravans, block bridges and roads and even pepper spraying voters. What can be done to help ourselves stay safe and protect voters and protesters? First things first, we have to stop expecting our law enforcement people to protect us. That's not their job. Their job is to go in and make sure that any sort of an uprising or any, any sort of subversive activity is put down. That's what the state does anything that you could possibly do that the state doesn't want you to do is reacted to by violence that's what law enforcement is about as long as it is a law enforcement uh white supremacist body that's all they have to offer you here's what you need to do 
and I keep talking about this and it's not a tagline. It's not some sort of slogan. It's true. You have to find the people that you trust. You have to form communities. You have to find people that you can lean on. And so when and if we have to go in the street and engage in mass protest or mass action, we have to have people around us that we know are going to be there for us and are going to abandon us and are going to hold us up when we need held up. So we have to stop waiting on law enforcement because that's not who they are. We need to start pushing for major reform. And this is one of those things, and I'm going to say this multiple times tonight, electing Joe Biden on Tuesday is not the end of this fight. It is the beginning of the fight. We have a hell of a lot of work to do. And that question of law enforcement and white supremacy within it and racial inequality, that's something that we need to fix over the next couple of years or over the next few years. It's not going to simply go away, but we have to be here for one another period. We have to form communities where we trust one another and we can rely on one another. <clears throat> Ellie, how is law enforcement in subtle and explicit ways abetted the attacks on Biden supporters campaign? What does that pretend for during and after the election, whatever the outcome? How do we, oh, and then how do we get law enforcement free of white supremacy? Major, major reform. We have to admit that there's a problem. We have to fix the problem. And there's another part of this that is a bigger conversation for another time, which is we have to we have to start engaging in law enforcement ourselves and turning it into a, a community exercise. But that's neither here nor there. What they have been doing in helping Trump supporters is part of who they are. Their entire focus is this Americanism right? It's how America has felt or been directed or the social norms or socialization that has made America feel the way that it is and made Americans behave the way that they have. It's a problem. It's a major, major problem. And it's one of the, the biggest issues is that Americans have been trapped in this big cycle of quote unquote rugged individualism, which is run through with white supremacy and it has led to law enforcement that makes sure that none of us step out of line and that we're all good consumers. And, you know, we just keep going the way that we are and we don't talk about white supremacy or any other of our bigger problems. It's a big issue. <clears throat> Jamie, what do you think will happen in Pennsylvania as far as the courts and counting ballots? First and foremost, I will say this. Uh, Trump and company are going to file lawsuits the moment that they can file lawsuits. I mean, obviously, they've already been working on this stuff, but yeah, they're going to they're going to contest everything. They're going to try and make sure, Romy, we're going to be OK. I know you're more stressed now, but we're going to be OK. I really, truly believe we are. Trump is going to push against all ballots. They've already told us their plan. He's gonna, he's going to declare victory on election night, particularly with a bunch of um absentee ballots and mail-in ballots not you know counting at that moment and needing to be counted later that's what they're going to do and they're going to constantly push against this stuff in litigation question is which court messes with that who makes what decision where it ends up and what we do what we do is a major thing and we have a little we have a couple questions here in a second where i'm going to get more in depth on this thing but yeah he's absolutely going to push against these things and he's going to try to delegitimize our votes. So just what's going to happen. Lewis Hall, I've heard about several unions going on strike if Biden wins and Trump refuses to leave. Uh, aside from hitting the streets, do you think a nationwide strike will be effective? I haven't heard about any union saying that, but I have to imagine that there are some out there. I mean, you know, I have to imagine that a lot of them right now are just sick of this shit and they're not going to put up with it. The big problem with the idea of a nationwide general strike is that we're at such a uh, lopsided economic moment that a lot of people are out of work. A lot of people are suffering. And the moment that a lot of us would go on strike, like we would just get replaced. I'm a professor. That's, you know, that's how I pay my mortgage. And I have to tell you that my entire field has been pushed to the point where there's a ton of people who don't have the jobs that they deserve or that they've earned. And so they are ready to come in and take the place. It's just so happens to be how lopsided the uh, labor situation is. That's the biggest issue. And Claire, that's an absolutely excellent point, a consumer strike. The question is whether or not it is going to be a situation where people think it is a viable thing 
for Trump to behave in this way. The moment that we start pushing back and the moment that we start putting pressure on the media to cover a narrative that maybe they wouldn't cover anyway, and the moment where the, the rich and powerful and leverage understand that we're not going to put up with this bullshit and we're not going to allow democracy to be subverted, that's a big, giant issue that's when maybe things could turn and rebecca exactly right it's poor adjuncts it's the way that they they move people away or you know people right now would die for a job and so if there's a big giant mass strike they'll just move us out and find cheaper labor plenty of people would be more than willing to find cheaper labor it's exactly like what happened in the pandemic the moment that the pandemic happened like there was a lot of, of corporations and businesses that were like, this is awesome. This is a course correction. We'll, we'll find lots of cheap labor. Well, we're really having a lot of problems right now, even though we're profiting, we need to lay off a bunch of people and bring in a lot of people who are going to be, you know, lower wage. So no, I, I, I don't know if a mass strike is the right thing, unless it takes up a big giant momentum, but a consumer strike is a thing and mass protests and mass action. These are things that we really might possibly have to do. I don't know what's going to happen in Georgia. If I had to put money on it right now, I would say that Trump wins Georgia, but that uh, the Democrats win the special election and that Ossoff gets close. I don't know about Ossoff. He could beat Purdue. There, there's been a little bit of a, of, a, of a switch lately. But I would guess right now, if I had to put money on it, that Trump wins Georgia um, Warnock wins the, the special election and also gets really, really close. Jake, what should the American people know about the vulnerability of our elections to manipulate of the computer counted results? And what recourse do we have to audit the results? So first and foremost, this is, this is one of the, um, more depressing answers to the questions. Every single presidential election, there are millions of people who don't have their votes counted. Our entire election system is screwed up from the bottom up. It's such a barbarous mess, massive, massive mess. So there's gonna be people who are disenfranchised. It's going to be terrible and completely unjustified. What recourse do we have? Not a lot. The sad truth is when you look at American history, and by the way, check out American Rule, a nation conquer the world but failed its people. And as long as I'm making um, uh, plugs, a reminder that um, on Tuesday, uh, Muckrake Podcast, me and Nick, my, my partner Nick, we're going to be hosting a watch along. I think Nick and I decided we're going to do, oh yeah, millions of votes every election. It's an absolute disaster. Uh, so I believe we're going to do from 930 to 1130, the real thick of things, uh, as long as we don't need to go out into the streets. Uh, so yeah, if you want to watch that and, um, you know, get, get involved in that, that's over at patreon.com slash muckrake podcast. Um, tonight I'm drinking a little bell mead. It's good bourbon. But anyway, it's the sad truth is that elections are not free and fair and they're not taking, they're not taken care of. It's an absolute disgrace and we have no recourse. We move forward. And then later on, we're like, isn't that terrible? That's just so sad that it just doesn't happen. It's awful. Have, assuming Trump loses and eventually concedes, what more damage can he will or will he do before the inauguration? I said earlier, the absolute best case scenario is the sour grapes scenario where Trump, you know, loses and he gets embarrassed. And he's like, well, I don't want to be your damn president anyway. Good luck, losers. And then he resigns in early December and Pence handles the lame duck session until January. That's the best case scenario. But my God, who knows what he's capable of? I think we have a budgetary situation coming up. Um, yeah, I agree. I don't think he's fighting that hard to walk away either. He could shut the government down. Uh, God knows that he could, you know, mess around with the structure. He could screw literally everything up before Biden gets in. He could do a lot of damage. And and this is a guy who, when he's not even, I mean, like the way that he's campaigned for his reelection is he has just. I, he, he, it's obvious that he doesn't want to, you know, actually appeal to people. What he could do when consequences are gone, I don't have a single clue what he's capable of. But gutting the civil service, absolutely. It could be terrible. Matt, what do you put the odds at Trump conceding if it's clear to most that he lost? Uh, I do a thing. Um, it's called um, scale probability. So scale probability, obviously, zero means no, not a chance. 100% means absolutely, without a doubt. 
what are the chances that Trump admits defeat uh, if he loses? I think this is a multi-tiered question. What are the chances that he admits defeat on election night? 10%. What's the chance that he just admits defeat and just gives up power willingly? 25, 25%, maybe, and maybe that's a high. I don't know. I, that, that, that to me feels optimistic. I don't even know if I would get up that high, but no, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's much chance that's going to happen. I, I cannot imagine a scenario where Trump just willingly admits defeat. I really can't. I mean, I could see him, I could see him possibly walking away from power while still saying that he won. And again, I've brought this up a couple of times. Like, I think there's a real possibility that he could, you know, end up either on OANN or uh, Fox News or Trump Network or whatever you want to call it. And he basically just sits there every single night and talks from like a fake made up, um, you know, oval office like he is a, an anti-president or something. I could see that and still saying that he won. I, I could absolutely see that happening. Sally, we're asking a lot of odds tonight. Sally, what are the odds the Supreme Court will overturn a Biden win? I don't think they'll overturn a Biden win. But, you know, if it, it because I think at that point, if he won, I don't think that they would move against that. The question is, I think, what are the odds the Supreme Court would hand a victory to Donald Trump? I think if it got to them, it's 100 percent. Will it happen? 40%? I would give it a 40%. If it gets to them, I think it's 100%. But if 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 it doesn't, you know, does it get to them? I'd say probably two or probably 40, probably 40%. That's where we're at, by the way. I think, and, and to give people an idea of where we're at, I think this thing's going to work out. I think, I think, I think more times than not, this thing is going to work out. But there is a large possibility, a really uncomfortable possibility that there it's going to get really bad. I completely agree, Nisha. They are absolutely trying to steal our votes right now. They are engaged in it right now. I completely agree. And that's the question. But I think if I had to say right now, coin flip, I would say that things turn out okay. But I... I there's a very large chance this thing gets bad. All right, so here we have three questions, and these are um, these are related. So I'm going to read these, and then I'm going to I'm going to answer them all together. It's important. Tunnel forty three. How do you think media will proceed on election night, given all the variables this year? Argus. My number one question at the moment, will all the networks fall for Trump's plan last minute cheating, his plan to declare victory in the early afternoon or evening of November 3rd? Will they all give him airtime and peace on earth? What do the Dems do when the mainstream media covers Trump declaration of victory as possible? I'll start with the last question first. It's not about what the Democratic Party does. The Democratic Party is not good at this. They're just not. This is not where they excel. Uh, they want very badly to appeal to the refs, the media, uh, the people. They want to say, this is awful. I can't believe this is happening. Somebody should do something when they are the people who need to do something about it. It's on us. It's on us. I, I keep saying this. Um, and by the way, I was really, really, really proud. Um, the, the guy who makes The Boys, the show on Amazon, which is, of course, like the anti-superhero series. I was really proud that he started to talk about this because I've been talking about this for like a year now. And I've kind of felt crazy. I was getting on it so much. Things like superheroes and the movies we watch and the popular culture we consume, it makes us expect someone to come save us. We keep expecting a messiah. We keep expecting a savior. And I keep, you know, people keep expecting like Mueller or Pelosi or this person or this person. It's not them. It's us. We have to save ourselves. Redemptive mythology. Funny enough, I'm actually, I'm doing research on the new book right now. And I'm like, I'm back in the Middle Ages. And it's just, it's left and right, this Messiah, Savior-ish idea 
right? Where it's it's you know there there's a there's an emperor who's coming and they're going to save us and and we, all we have to do is recognize them and give them power. It's about us. We have to make sure this doesn't work. We have to vote him out first and foremost. We have to go out. We have to vote. We have to mobilize. And then on top of it, if that if that asshole tries to steal this election, we can't let it happen. Can't let it happen. We just can't. And people will say to me, they're like, well, what do we do? Well, we do something. We get out in the street. We engage in mass action. We engage in solidarity and organization. We cannot let it happen. Because if this dude steals the election and it's allowed to happen, there ain't a whole lot of looking back. I have to tell you what we have seen over the past four or five years, and even the past few decades, going back into Reagan and Nixon. No, it's going to be bad. It's going to be really, really bad. And it's going to be a lot, lot, lot worse. So, no, we can't allow it to happen. That's a simple clue. Now, what's the media going to do? That's a hell of a good question. Because I have to tell you that they are not prepared for this thing. They treat this whole thing. And, and this is something I want everyone to think about for a second. I want everybody to think about how this feels like a season finale. You know what I mean? Like that, that internal feeling, like where you're getting ready to watch on TV, you're getting ready to watch the season finale of your favorite show. That's not by accident. That's, that's intentional. That's what they do. They've created a situation where it feels like we are in a spectacle. We are in some sort of a, um, a simulation of, 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 of actual politics. We're watching it all come together. That's why when people talk about it, they're like, oh, man, you know, the, the writers this season are out of control or whatever. It's not a TV show. It's real life. And the way that they are set up, the media, is to treat this like it's a season finale. So they want to have a winner on election night. They've done this before. They've screwed it all up because they want it so bad. And by the way, I, I would argue tomorrow, if you can, watch the documentary 537 Votes. It's worth watching. It's about the 2000 election and how the Republicans stole it. It's a rough watch. It's a rough hang. I have to tell you the truth. But you need to understand that this is a possibility. But the media, the media is a big issue because they just, uh, it's streaming HBO, I believe. They, they can't, they cannot call him a fascist and they can't deal with it. They just can't. They're not wired like that. The biggest issue is that our economy and all of the things all of the things that they are set up to prioritize and profit off of are poisonous and toxic to culture and society at large. The media is not ready for this election. They're not ready to deal with this thing. So I imagine they're having one meeting after another about how to deal with this thing, and they're still going to screw it up. But it's on us. It's not on the Democratic Party. It's on us. It's on the American people. And a heart. What do you think of the intense legal team on the other side? Or that they're, oh my God, there are people right now, there are people right now who are getting ready to fight this election and are ready to fight this lawsuit. It will make their entire careers. There are people who are going to retire off of the money that they are going to get from fighting this election. Period. Period. The lawyers, I mean, it's it, it, it's almost comical. The lawyers are stuffing the napkins into, you know, their, their shirts and they're like sharpening their knives. They're absolutely ready for this thing. And right now, that sound you hear, that humming you hear, that's all of the think tanks and strategist places in Washington, D.C., holding a lot of late night meetings, simulating these things, thinking about these things, coming up with strategies, turning out white papers, left and right. Left and right, there are people who are ready for this. Aaron, in a scenario where Trump loses, he will still have effective control of the government for three months. Is it a, is it a stretch think he may be lashing out the country who rejected him? How do you see COVID-19 response in those months? So COVID-19 is an interesting thing because he's not really doing anything right now anyway. Of course, for the longest time, Trump was, you know, keeping PPE and life-saving supplies from everybody, you know, everybody in blue states. 
and was, you know, engaging in basic genocide. So I don't think he'll do anything for COVID if he loses and he's a lame duck. The question is, will the country start taking their notes and start thinking about the pandemic based on what Biden says? Will he become the ruler de facto? So like, will all of a sudden, you know, people start listening to these things and start actually thinking about the science, all those types of things. Um, But that being said, there are going to be people who, you know, are going to follow Trump no matter what. They're not going to wear masks because Trump politicized masks and, you know, they're not going to believe in this thing because Trump told them not to believe in it. But I, I, the COVID thing, the COVID thing will be an interesting thing. It'll be a, it'll be a real bellwether thing to see how people deal with that. If Biden wins and uh, he starts leading on that issue, that issue. Erica, do you think there's a chance that we'll, we will sleep soundly and feel well rested on January 21st? I think that America is going to be in the most danger between election night and let's say November 17th. Let's say there's a two week period where I think America is going to be in the most danger. I want to believe, oh, Erica, uh, there's optimism here. There absolutely is. We're just dealing with things as they are. That's it. We're talking about where things are. It doesn't mean that's where they're going to be. But I think we're going to, I think we might have a two week period where America is in a lot of trouble. Where America is in a lot of trouble. That being said, you want to talk about optimism? I'll talk about this. I think that this is a moment that you and I will look back on. And we're going to be proud of what we did and how we behaved. I really, truly believe that. We care about this thing. We reject Trump's bullshit. And I think that if he tries something, I think we're going to be there and we're going to hold him accountable. I truly, honestly do. I, I have I have actual hope. You know, I, I was doing an interview the other day and uh, I was talking about American rule and I was talking about how Um, you know, American history doesn't look the way that um, we all thought it did or these stories that like, you know, we keep ourselves warm with at night. And somebody asked me, they were like, how can you possibly be uh, be positive or be optimistic about this thing? And the truth is, yeah, in a lot of ways we've been here before. I, by the way, Victor, I don't think it's 30 or 40 percent of America is lost completely. I think it's more like 20 percent of America. And I know that that doesn't seem all that much better, but I think that 10 to 20 percent is is I think it's fungible. I think that's good. I'm optimistic. I am. I am optimistic. I think we're going to win this election. I think Trump is going to try every shit trick in the book. And I think there are a ton of people out there who are going to try a lot of bullshit but I think we're going to make it through. I really, truly do. I think people are tired of Donald Trump. I think there are people who voted for him in 2016 who are tired of him. I've talked to a lot of them. I know a lot of them. They're tired. It doesn't mean that the Trumpists are going to come home to roost or that the cult is going to fall apart. I have faith. I have faith. I actually do. I am hopeful. I am actually hopeful. Sebastian, can we also discuss how there was an attempt to throw out millions of votes in Texas by Republicans? The, 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 the Texas Republican Party is gone. Gone. And by the way, here's the reason why. And this is something to remember. The reason why the Texan Republican Party is as crazy bash and insane as they are is because they understand that the tide is shifting. They can't win these elections anymore. The demographics simply aren't on their side. So they have to plunge directly into subterfuge and conspiracy theories and fascistic behaviors. That's the honest to God truth. All of these people recognize the writing on the wall. They understand that they are not just a minority, but that they are a massive minority and that the demographics are not on their side. So they are trying right now to go ahead and cheat and make a way that they can cheat forevermore, whether it's through disenfranchising or gerrymandering or through the packing of the the court. Um, 
they they are trying very hard to move past democracy and past democratic institutions. They're not bigger than us. They're so small and they're so pathetic. They're so sad. And 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 they're just making this big noise and they're just trying so hard to to rig this thing in their favor. That's why they're doing what they're doing is because they are a party and a group that have had power and now they're losing power. Period. Oh, if if Trump loses, Pence will try and run for the president in four years and he won't even make it past the primary. Starman, short, medium, long-term consequences of Republican Democratic election win in regards to health and U.S. democracy. I'll, I'll try and answer both. Uh, I think if Trump wins, uh, we're in a lot of trouble, period. I, I, I just think at that point, we basically live in a QAnon reality and, uh, you know, there's really not any moving back from that. But that's neither here nor there. Democratic win, which is what I think will happen. I think that Joe Biden will get elected. I think the Democratic Party will win the Senate and keep the House. Uh, I think we're going to see a small civil war within the Democratic Party where the left challenges uh, the center left and the middle, which I've talked about now for a while, and where they start making questions about, you know, what we want to do moving forward. Then, meanwhile, I think the Republican Party, as they have always done whenever they are out of power, they will say that Joe Biden and everyone around him is engaged in a liberal anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. And I think we'll see a uh, rise in right-wing extremism and possibly terrorism. And that's something we'll have to deal with. But I, I, I think I think what happens is Biden wins the presidency, Democrats win the Senate and keep the House. And then all of a sudden, we need to have a fight about what the Democratic Party is and what the agenda is. And I think that's where that fight starts happening. Toonbox says, let's say it's clear on election night that Biden wins Florida, Georgia, Texas, total blowout. Trump declares victory anyway. What does Biden do next? What does Trump do next? Um, if I had to say right now, I think Trump wins Georgia. I think Trump wins Texas. Florida is more of a, of a, a swing state. I'm not quite sure what's going to happen there. Uh, you could talk me into Georgia. I think Texas is going to Trump. I, I, we're, we're getting close on Texas, but, you know, I don't think that's right. I think Biden does the old thing where he says, this is crazy. Why would anyone listen to this? And I, Oh, I think, I think Biden wins North Carolina and Pennsylvania in a walk. I think I, I, I think North Carolina and Pennsylvania are solidly with Biden. Um, what happens next? I think Biden just says, I'm the president. Are you going to listen to this loon or are you going to listen to me? And I think that's when mass action really plays a big, giant role. Trump is just going to try and litigate and slander his way to some sort of, you know, half-assed victory. That's what he's going to do. Uh, Wobblies United, have you seen the new Borat movie? I have seen the new Borat movie. Uh, not as good as the first one. There's a couple of moments in it that I thought were uh, funny, but there's some very disgusting and disturbing individuals living in this nation. Seriously, how do we combat this type of hate and vitriol? So one of the things that I think that the Borat franchise really gets across, and this is something just to say... Um, you know, when I was covering the Trump campaign back in 2015 and 2016, um, you know, this is one of the reasons I was able to report the way that I was. It shows what people people are capable of saying and believing and standing by when there's somebody else there who is saying something that maybe they agree with or maybe they don't like or maybe they maybe it makes them feel uncomfortable, which is that people perform for one another. And, you know, they, they will try and outdo one another and they, they, they try and goad each other on or they try and be more extreme than the other. So what Borat does, you know, when he says this stuff and people just sort of stand there and nod or say those kinds of things, I think that it shows what particularly in America we see, which is that people get moved into fascism, racism and misogyny, not just based on how they feel, but also the performative aspect, which is something we don't like to talk about. We don't all like to talk about how um, we get influenced by other people at all. Group think. Yeah, exactly. Sebastian, why would the Trump administration remove the wolf endangered protection? Because they're dicks. 
It's the exact same thing. They don't care about any of this stuff. It's, you know, whatever, whatever it is that will piss somebody off, whatever it is that will upset somebody that will trigger the libs or whatever in the hell it is, they'll do it. They want to pretend that they're strong and they want to pretend that they're, you know, be, you know, tougher than everybody else. They're lame. And on top of that, it's about removing environmental protection. That's exactly right. And it's about making sure that corporations and polluters and people who don't give a damn about the environment are just going to continue to profit and, you know, plunder everything. They suck. The reason why Trumpers are so angry is multifaceted. First and foremost, they're afraid. They know that they're losing and they know that things are happening that are beyond their control. So there are a lot of them on one hand who have been taught or told or believe, no, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with this stupid thing. I think there are some who are ignorant and I think ignorance is different than stupid. And first and foremost, I'll say like, my family, who a lot of them are Trump supporters and a lot of them have been radicalized, they're not stupid. They're ignorant. They don't know any better. Like, they don't have, they don't have a way of understanding what's happened to them in a lot of cases. I mean, that, that's not all of them. There are a lot of Trump supporters and a lot of Trumpists who understand what's going on and they're trying to keep their white supremacist misogynistic advantage. Like, they, they, they know that. And, you know, there, there's a lot of them that are doing that, particularly the very, very wealthy Trump supporters. They're still trying to maintain their advantage. But I will tell you that there are a lot of people, they don't have, they don't have the, the language or the understanding of what has happened in order to really understand how Trump is lying to them. I talk about this a lot in American Rule. Um, like, for instance, like the New World Order conspiracy theory. It's just a simplification of global economics that replaces the market and, and market actors with conspiracies and, you know, evil puppet masters and all of that stuff. And absolutely, it's about nostalgia. There are a bunch of people who have determined who they are and what their identities are based on America and the story of America and Christianity and maleness and femininity and all that bullshit that they just don't want to give up on. Or they can give up on because the moment that it moves away, they'll fall apart. There's a lot of people. I, I, I really think that we're in the middle of a mental health crisis, a massive, massive mental health crisis. And I think American exceptionalism is um, I, I, I think it's one of the most dangerous things we've got going. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's not a conspiracy. It's capitalism which is its own conspiracy, but it just works in a different way. They're not meeting in smoke-filled rooms. They're meeting in beautiful, you know, conference rooms. But it's it's mental health. There's a lot of people who are just stuck in a reality that doesn't exist, and Trump has hacked into it and used it against them. And the Republican Party has done the exact same thing. And I mean, so much of it, of course, is white supremacy and misogyny and all of it put together. Yeah. Nathaniel says, how can an election get stolen? Well, that's a great question uh at this point one of the things that we might actually see is the possibility that trump could be outvoted both in a popular vote and an electoral vote and he could and, and by the way what we're talking about is reality I, I i keep trying to have conversations with people left and right about this because everyone wants to believe reality is you know objective and not changeable but it's completely malleable so he could turn into a situation trump could where he says you know i won these votes and the rest of them are fake and as long as he's able to use the courts to uh, and by the way that's what the courts are there for the courts are there to be like the the mediators about what reality is real so trump could say this is my reality the courts would hold him up and then all of a sudden all of our um you know, all of our levies and all of our protective measures and democratic institutions fail. That's how an election gets stolen. Arbenz invokes says, Arbenz invokes, regarding battles over imagery that we should be able to win, the blue line flag desecration and the Pinochet helicopter ride slogan should be both losing images for the alt-right if their critics don't dwell on white supremacy, agree. Yeah, I mean, it's fascism in, in, in absolute operation. Absolutely. It's fascism. This thing that you're seeing with the flag being bled of color, oh, that is fascism 101. They're taking old icons and making them into a new thing in order to bleed their power plus also push their ideology. That's what's happening. 
And these people, they'll tell you the honest to God truth. They're all for either making sure that people can't vote or are afraid to vote or voice their opinions or whatever. These are conversations we should win. But the problem is, going back to what I was talking about, it's all blended in and knotted in with these old ideas. So like right now, the people who are like trying to run a Biden-Harris bus off the road, they think they're being patriots. They really, truly do. They think that they're doing like a real American thing, that they're being patriots by intimidating people. That's what ends up happening. And absolutely 9-11 triggered almost all of this, what we're seeing. There's a lot of old historical things happening, but 9-11 drudged up a lot of this. And you have a nation that got attacked. And since 9-11, we've been in decline. Like America is failing right now. Like we can't, we can't defeat a pandemic. We can't respond to disasters. We can't take care of our own. We can't have health care or infrastructure. We need to recognize that American hegemony just doesn't work. It has failed, and it was based on a bunch of lies and a bunch of mistakes. We need to figure out a new thing that's realer, more human, and, and real. Just real. I agree. America has been failing for some of... Uh, yeah, I completely agree. Right now, what is ending up happening? I'm glad Nisha said that. For a lot of people, America has always failed them. It just so happens that the majority of Americans at this point are starting to understand that it's been failing other people, and now it's failing them, which is one of the things we see in these inflection points in American history. That's what happened in the 1960s and early 1970s, is people looked up and they're like, what? Are you really saying that America has been racist and has mistreated people of color for all this time? And are you saying that America is a technocracy that has been anti-democratic? That's crazy. Well, that's been the case. It's always been the case. America from the very beginning has been a lie. But here's the good news. Because of where we're at and because this thing is becoming more and more obvious, we can change. We're at a moment of, of, of sea change because we recognize that this thing is failed and because we're at this moment where we realize that this current course doesn't work anymore and then it never actually worked we can do something else we could and i keep saying one of the one of the most hopeful moments that i saw was during the blm protest where 70 percent of americans started to understand systemic inequality that's massive 70% of Americans agreed on one thing, which is just massive. I think we can do it. And I think we can get to something better. I keep saying this, and, and we're getting up on one hour, and then we got one last question left, and then we're going to say our goodbyes and, and, and wish each other well. Start thinking about what you want. Keep saying it. We are at the point of the election, and obviously Tuesday is going to be really, really hard. Write down on a piece of paper a few things. Number one, oh, I think that BLM, it wasn't that it was slandered. I think that was part of it. I think it's the media decided it wasn't entertaining anymore. And they took the cameras off. And then all of a sudden it left a vacuum that the right started filling in. And that's when the slandering happened. I think it was the twofer. I think both of those things happening together. I think it was that the media decided that it wasn't going to lead to ratings anymore. And it had, it had reached its crescendo as a TV show. And then the right came in and just kept playing it and you know slandered it and turned it into what they wanted to. I think that's what happened there. It was a mess. Um, I would say that I would write down on a piece of paper. First and foremost, and, and I'm going to answer a question in here, is what would get you out in the street? What would lead you to mass action? What is the line in the sand that you will not be allowed to cross? What will Trump do? What will the Republicans do that will, it's non-negotiable for you? You need to write that down because when it happens, if it happens, when it happens, you need to be ready to go. You need to hold yourself accountable because these people are all about altering reality. It's all about malleable realities. But I would also start writing down what you want this country to look like, because defeating Donald Trump on Tuesday is not the end. It's the beginning of a larger fight. What do you want America to look like in the future? Because these people have an idea what they want to look like in the future. Neo-fascists want to re rewind time. 
They want to move back to a point where people didn't have a vote and that people were enslaved and children were working in factories and in mines. They know what they want from the future. Start asking yourself, what do you want from the future? What is a priority for you? What should we be taking care of? What should we be doing? These are big, giant questions that we have to start wrestling around with. All right, so we have one more question, but we are moving up on the one hour point and we toast at that point. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Cheers. So as I fill this up and we get ready to answer the last question, say our goodbyes. Wish each other well, wish each other luck. I just want to say I appreciate you again. It was hard getting ready for tonight. I wanted to say the right things. I wanted to put this thing in the right frame of mind for what Tuesday was going to be like, but this is a, uh, man, this is a hard-ass time. And I appreciate you a lot. I have voted. I have voted. I got in and out. I got in and out. It was pretty quick. Thank you. I needed a haircut. Woo! I needed a haircut bad. It was a weird experience. It was a weird, weird experience. It was safe, but it was weird. I agree, Sarah. I think we will win on Tuesday. I don't know if it'll be um I don't know if it'll be declared on Tuesday, but I think we're gonna win. So before we start saying our goodbyes, wishing each other well, I appreciate you too. Sean says, Jared, what is your red line? That if you cross, you'll be organizing, protesting, and hitting the streets. So here, here's the thing. And again, I'll, I'll start with a um, start with a plug. Uh, we're going to be watching the returns with the, the Muckrake crew and the Muckrake community. Um, if you want to watch it with us, it's over at patreon.com slash muckrake podcast. We'll be live from, I believe it is 9.30 to 11.30. Um, maybe later, if, if we're doing it. And uh, Nick, I don't know if Nick has bailed or pulled the eject cord on this talk, but Nick doesn't want to, Nick doesn't want to be on all night. But if, 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 it gets, if it gets crazy, I, I don't know. I'll probably get back on YouTube live and talk to you, the rest of you. Um, because it's going to be a lot. My line in the sand is Trump declaring a victory when obviously he hasn't won. That's a problem. Now, I, it, and obviously he's told everybody who will listen. His surrogates have told everybody on TV that they're planning on declaring victory. And uh, um, yeah, if he does that, declares victory... I'm finding people to go out on the street. So the reason I brought it, brought up the live stream is I'm going to say, good luck, everybody. I have to go. I have to go. I have, I have to go engage in my democratic duty. There are certain times in your life that you get called on in order to resist fascism. That's the truth. I, I would like to leave the world better than I found it. And I know that you do too. So my line in the sand is if he declares victory, it's if he starts trying to shut down counts. Um, if all of a sudden we're trying to get to a, if he's trying to shut down counts and trying to disenfranchise Americans, I'm finding people and I'm organizing, or I'm going to be on the side of the road standing there. I, that's, that's my, that's my thing. I know, I know who I would go with at this point. I would organize and talk to other people. I would find other people who'd be willing to go. Um, at this point, big car rallies, I don't know if those are safer. I mean, they're starting to run people off the road. I mean, that's the reality of this thing. So my line in the sand is if he declares victory early or if he tries to um, shut down the counts, period. This is going to be exhausting. I'm sorry. I wish... I, the good news is, I really, truly believe we're going to win. I think we're going to beat back fascism. 
I think that we're going to make this country better. I think that I think that now that we've stared into the inky black abyss, I think we're going to decide what matters and we're going to figure it out. And there are more than there are more of us, period. And it's been an exhausting four years. I've aged in dog years. But I think we're going to make it. I do. I think we're going to make it. You need to be ready on Tuesday night. And I understand not everybody can go out. I understand not everybody can can figure a way out. Figure out what you can do. I think we're going to make it. I really do. Uh, I, I hope that that's how it turns out. And I have seen enough and I believe enough and I believe in you. And I believe in this community that we've built up. And I believe enough people are decent that we're going to move away from this thing. I'm exhausted. I'm absolutely exhausted. And I know that you are too. And again, just to, you know, put a little emotion on the top of the whole thing and and reiterate the hope and move on. Um, Dealing with this thing and watching the beauty in all of you and watching you support one another and watching you support me and Nick and the podcast and this thing. It's been a lot to me. And, um, it really, really has. And you've made me, you've made me more hopeful. And I want to thank you so much for that. And all the people in, in my life, like you're up there. And uh, this thing, again, it feels like a damn season finale, which is stupid. I mean, we're still going to do this. I mean, we're going to do this next weekend, next Sunday. I'm not going away. It's just the beginning of a fight. If we went on Tuesday, it's just the beginning of the fight. But, yeah, I don't know. Maybe Georgia, maybe I'll go to D.C. I don't know. i got to figure it out. I've got people I need to talk to. But I appreciate you. Much love to everybody out there. Appreciate all the fighting you do. And, um, yeah, thank you so much. I um, one, one last time before we, um, <laughs> before we, we jump down this rabbit hole, I want to propose a toast. We'll have, um, we'll have an Election Day Muckrake podcast on Tuesday. And then I suppose a reaction on Friday. We'll be doing the live broadcast Tuesday night, 9.30 to 11.30. And God knows I might be on here doing this thing. Um, but in the meantime, I just want to say thank you. I have faith in all of you. Find some rest between now and Tuesday believe that there are other people who can take on the fight when you cannot love yourself be kind take good care of yourself we're going to beat back fascism i honestly truly believe that cheers here's to fighting back fascism all right everyone i will see you soon let's do this thing take care have hope